Hello, my name is David and welcome to this behind the scenes video covering the fourth episode of my Dinosauria series, Sea and Sky. In this video, I will be going over the artwork I created for the film, the challenges rigging and animating such strange and prehistoric creatures, on top of the usual rundown of scientific accuracies, inaccuracies, and also my creative process building this big clay sculpture I made for the film as well. So, let's get started. Even though this film is part of my Dinosauria series, this particular animation does not actually feature any dinosaurs at all. The film features bony fish, cartilaginous fish, mosasaurs and pterosaurs, none of which belong to the Dinosauria clade. Pterosaurs are not dinosaurs, but both families are still often lumped together in films and books and toy boxes, which is quite understandable. Pterosaurs and dinosaurs look very similar, they both appeared at around the same time and lived alongside one another throughout the Mesozoic period, both reaching similar large sizes and parallel success. The two groups are closely related, so closely related that they share pycnofibrous fluffy coatings, endothermic metabolisms and hollow bones. Pterosaurs are just about as closely related to dinosaurs as it's possible to be without actually being dinosaurs. The pop culture depiction you see of dinosaurs in film and TV and video games isn't particularly accurate, but it is far better than the archaic persona that pterosaurs still have in most people's minds. Most people, when imagining a dinosaur, now at least picture a warm-blooded, active animal that is in some way related to birds. But the mainstream interpretation of pterosaurs is often still the flapping and squawking reptilian sky vermin virtually unchanged since 1933's King Kong. I decided to create this film, break my rules and focus on a bunch of non-dinosaurs because I wanted to counter that interpretation. I wrote this film with the goal of portraying these animals as noble, respectable and competent animals. A particularly big influence for the tone of this film was this painting here by paleoartist Mark Witten called Tyrannageddon from 2016. This painting perfectly captured the effective, strong and confident qualities I wanted to convey in my pterosaurs, and I'm sure just looking at it, the inspiration that led to Sea and Sky is quite obvious. I have been making clay sculptures for each of my Dinosauria films, and for Sea and Sky I of course decided to create a mature male Geosternbergia. I created the sculpture in pretty much the exact same way I've created the rest, with Daz air drying clay rolled up into a bunch of sausage tubes which were then dried and glued together into sort of a pteranodon looking stick figure. I then proceeded to bulk out this foundation with more and more clay, eventually leading to the general form of a pterosaur. Once this basic mesh was blocked out, I then got to work on the finer surface details. As far as I know, we have no direct evidence of scaly skin on pterosaurs at all. Instead, these animals seem to all be covered in fur-like or feather-like pycnofibers and possibly areas of scaleless skin as well. 
once the sculpt was finished, I primed the model, painted it with acrylic paints and brushes, and of course, remembered to serenade the piece while waiting for each coat to dry. Is this fan over? It keeps spinning around. I have been sculpting dinosaurs for as long as I can remember, but I don't think I've ever sculpted a pterosaur before. Pterosaurs have body plans unlike any animal to ever exist, and having to tangibly form these alien anatomical shapes unlike the rest of the animal kingdom that I'm so familiar with, I think left me with an unexpected respect and appreciation for this weird, unique group of creatures. Overall, I think this sculpture is pretty good. He is a weird colour, heavily resembling one of these, and he's also a weird shape. But he's also a pterosaur, and pterosaurs are super weird, so that's probably fine. Here, finally, is the whole family of Dinosauria sculptures so far. Just one more left to go. This film is set 85 million years ago in the Neobrara Formation in what is now Kansas, and follows a flock of mostly female Geosternbergia. The pterosaurs are hungry and want to dive into the sea below to feed, but the group is hesitant to enter the water. Dangerous predators lurk in these depths. The larger, dominant male of the group emerges and wastes no time as he dives into the dangerous sea. The onlookers, tenser than ever, watch their alpha descend into the darkness and snatch his prize, but he has not succeeded just yet. Mesozoic sharks hunting in the shallows are curious of the pterosaur, but the real threat comes in the form of something far larger. Spurred on by the male's successful display, the rest of the pterosaur group take flight, one by one, diving into the deep. Our alpha male returns to his perch and watches his flock from high above, as they conquer their fears, take the plunge and hunt for themselves. A hunt that he inspired. Geosternbergia would have been adept walkers on the land, swimmers in the sea, and flyers in the air, and these three different ways of getting about have drastically different associated emotional connotations, which gave me an idea for the story structure of this film. This film has three acts, an opening, slower act which is on the ground, a tension-filled sinking middle act which takes place in the sea, and a triumphant third act where we finally take to the skies. This whole series has been inspired by nature documentary filmmaking, but none more so than Sea and Sky. This film was written to mimic exactly the type of scenario you would see play out in a real-life nature documentary segment. I wanted this film to have this more natural, realistic tone in contrast to, say, A More Ancient Spring, which has a far more fantastical tone, to really hammer home the idea that these creatures were… real. I wanted to portray Geo Sternbergia as an inspiration, and I felt stripping back as many fantastical elements as I could was the correct way to go about doing that. Sea and Sky, on a shot-for-shot -shot basis, was one of the more time-consuming films I've ever worked on. The film doesn't have a single simple shot. This is an example of a simple shot. It's from Old Buck, and it's just a 3D animated dinosaur on a 2D static background. That's it. But for Sea and Sky, because this film is set during a thunderstorm, by the coast and in the sea, there are no static backgrounds. 
I have avoided depicting these kinds of environments as often as I can, because water is an incredibly hard thing to animate. However, for this film, I felt it was finally time to face my fear. All of these effects, the waves, the splashes, the bubbles, the lightning and the rain, individually are simple effects that I've known how to do for a while. I've just never really had to compile so many all at once. Some of these effects turned out a lot nicer than others. I really like the bubbly movement effects around my characters as they swim through the sea, and I also love the look of the lightning here. But I really don't like this slow motion splashing effect made by my Mosasaur as it breaches out of the water. I am, overall, quite happy with the final result here though, and I learned a lot of new tricks working on this film. Just knowing that I can pull off settings like this opens the door to so many more storytelling opportunities in future short films. The first animal featured in the film is the pterosaur Geo Sternbergia, formerly Pteranodon sternbergi. These animals hunted on the coast and in the sea on a diet of fish and squid. Geo Sternbergia was heavily sexually dimorphic. Males were around twice the size of the females and sported much larger, more elaborate crests. Male specimens are also a lot less common than female specimens, suggesting a polygamous mating system similar to a lot of modern seals, where large groups consisting of numerous females would be competed over by fewer, larger males for breeding rights over the entire group. This is the system I decided to depict in my film. The Geosternbergia flock depicted consists almost entirely of females led by one dominant mature male. I made sure to create a decent amount of individual variation throughout the group, and if you look very closely, there's even one sneaky juvenile male in there as well, who's just starting to grow in his reddish purple colouring and larger crest. A lot of the sound effects used in my Dinosauria series I record myself. That was too much. <laughs> For this film, my Geo Sternbergia vocalizations here were created using a royalty free sound of a bird, which I pitch shifted and slowed down mixed with the sound of some clacking beaks, which I recorded myself using a bamboo bowl and a plank of wood. Creating the Pterosaur 3D models and rigs for this film was a massive challenge. Getting these guys to fly and to swim was relatively simple, but folding this model up into a realistic standing position and getting it to walk was almost impossible with the wonky rigs that I originally created. On screen right now is some of the earliest footage of this film that I rendered out, featuring my original Geo Sternbergia rigs. These early models were a nightmare and were full of inaccuracies and rigging issues. Here, in comparison, is the latest footage of the film after months and months of tiny tweaks to make the rigs more usable and the models more anatomically accurate. These changes including adding webbed feet, fixing the wing posture and removing the wing membrane between the ankles and the tail. In my sketchbook drawings and my sculpture, the pteroid bone is also very prominent. This backwards facing wrist bone is unique to pterosaurs, but it's totally obscured into the anatomy of the wing in my finished animation model. 
This isn't a mistake, it was much easier to animate this way and having the bone hidden within the flesh of the wing isn't unreasonable, but in retrospect, I think I far prefer the look of the more prominent pteroid and I kinda wish I implemented it. The final animals featured in the film, after a bunch of mistakes, a ton of tweaks and a ton of fixes, are otherwise accurately portrayed, with the correct social structure, drastic sexual dimorphism, they're feeding in the sea, and they're launching into the air using their powerful arms over their smaller, weaker legs. The way that my male Geo Sternbergia takes off from the sea using almost exclusively his powerful arms to skim across the surface of the water into eventual flight, is also exactly how we believe these animals would have taken off from the sea. One substantial inaccuracy remains though, and it's present in all of my drawings, my sculpture, and my 3D models. All of the pterosaurs in this animation walk on the tips of their toes. They are digitigrade, like this. But it turns out we have a lot of direct fossil trackway evidence that confirms that these animals would have walked on their toes and their heels. They would have walked plantigrade, like this. I caught this mistake far too late, and fixing it would require reanimating the majority of the film again, for the third or fourth time, and I do have my limits. The second animal featured in the film is the prehistoric shark Crotoxyrhina, which does not have a sketchbook page dedicated to it, so I suppose this will have to do. Crotoxyrhina could grow very large, much larger than what I depict in this film. This was intentional, though, as the sharks in the film are supposed to be juveniles and subadults hunting in the shallows. I did this because I wanted them to be more abundant, hesitant to attack the pterosaur, more skittish, and the smaller that they are, the larger my mosasaur looks in comparison. We actually have direct evidence of Crotoxyrhina hunting pterosaurs. LACM50926 is a Pteranodon longiceps specimen that famously has a shark's tooth embedded in its neck, that tooth belonging to this exact species. All modern sharks are also sexually dimorphic. Females are generally much larger than the males, and the males have a pair of penis-like extensions to their pelvic fins called claspers. I, of course, made sure to include these details on a couple of Microtoxyrhina as well. The third and final animal featured in the film is the Mosasaur Tylosaurus. Mosasaurs, like pterosaurs, were also not dinosaurs. They're not even closely related to dinosaurs. Mosasaurs are actually related to modern-day monitor lizards and snakes. These animals were oceanic predators that became incredibly successful during the later half of the Cretaceous, Tylosaurus here being one of the largest of the group, easily rivaling the size of Tyrannosaurus rex. Now, I'm only 25 years old, but as a kid I don't remember anyone else really knowing what a mosasaur was, which seems to have massively changed in the past 10 or 15 years. Mosasaurs and Spinosaurs are the two prehistoric groups I think I've seen rise the most in mainstream popularity in my lifetime, but I feel mosasaurs are often misrepresented in mainstream media as simple crocodiles with flippers, which isn't really correct. I tried to make my take on the species look as accurate as I possibly could. My design is streamlined, looking a whole lot more like a monitor lizard over an alligator, with the anatomically correct big tail fluke, the iconic second row of teeth in the upper jaw, and it even has a forked tongue, a feature that is shared by all of its modern day relatives. 
The colour scheme for this species was inspired by a mix of an orca and a lace monitor, which I feel might be every single paleo artist's go-to while reconstructing this animal, but I really like the simplicity of the final result. I can't really imagine this animal looking any other way than this. Sky ended up being a lot more work than I expected. The finished film is only three or four minutes long, but it was originally conceived as an even shorter two minute film. It was conceived as an easy, simple, complimentary piece to the Dinosauria series that I could bang out relatively quickly. The original two minute cut of this film was finished and it was finished months ago. It was literally exactly the same film as the final cut, but with half of the shots missing and it was really, really bad. It was too fast paced, it was uninteresting, and it was rushed. Full of animation errors, cut corners, and scientific inaccuracies. I ended up extending and tweaking that film seemingly endlessly into the product it finally became, wasting a lot of time doing so. For example, in the original two minute cut of this film, the Crotoxy Rhino were only supposed to be seen from a distance, so the model I made was very low detail and crudely animated. However, as I extended the film, I needed close-ups of the sharks, so I had to go back and create a higher detail, better animated Crotoxy Rhino. However, as I continued to extend the film, I also ended up needing a shot of the shark bearing its teeth. Neither of my Crotoxy Rhino had functioning mouths, so I had to create a third shark with a 3D modelled, textured and animated mouth. I made three Crotoxy Rhino rigs for this film for three separate purposes, when all I really needed to create was the last one, which can do all three things. This is a perfect example of the constant retreading and time wasting that kept happening because of my early mistakes, and is also why Crotoxy Rhino doesn't have a sketchbook page. Oh. That all being said though, I surprisingly quite like the final film. I, I think I love it. It was incredibly tedious and boring to make, but it somehow grew on me and has become my second favourite of the series just after our frozen past. To me, Sea and Sky is the most realistic feeling film of the Dinosauria series and that was the intention. I set out to create a film that felt real and portrayed pterosaurs as confident and inspirational, at the same time challenging myself technically by setting a film in and around the sea. I feel the film succeeds in doing all of that. Besides my tippy toe pterosaurs, this is exactly the film I wanted to make. It just took me a long, long time to get there. Hopefully, the final film in this series isn't as much trouble, but I mean, part of me doubts that because at the moment the finale is shaping up to be the longest and most ambitious film of the whole series. If you want to support me or support this Dinosauria series, or read through the sketchbook I've been showing off in this video, you can. High resolution photographs of the entire Dinosauria sketchbook so far are up on my Patreon page right now. You can also gain access to each of my animated short films two weeks before they're released here on YouTube. Thank you all so much for watching. But it is the end of the video, and that means I have to leave my house again and film some outro b-roll. Today, I know exactly what I'm going to be doing. I'll be taking this pteranodon model right here, and we're going to walk down to the coast, where he rightfully belongs.
special thanks to all my top Patreon supporters on screen right now. Hopefully scrolling over some footage of a happy Tyranodon in his natural habitat. This Dinosauria series would not be possible without these guys, so again, thank you very, very much. Bye guys. Oh no, my knees! My knees! I have to go! I'm feeling! <laughs>